and then eventually I will introduce Mark Turner to you. Uh, and one could do a really long introduction of Mark Turner and sort of list all the books and, uh, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and I won't do that. But uh, I'll just say that we're extremely proud and happy to have such a prominent cognitive scientist, cognitive linguist as Mark. And I know for a fact that his work has meant a lot to a lot of people in this room and has been actively used and that people are really enthusiastic to hear this talk. And I would also like to say that he's been here as a fellow at the Center of Advanced Study all this year and has been doing really great, fun, groundbreaking work uh, on uh, multi uh, in using multimodal corpora, which is uh, very exciting, I think. So we're looking very much forward to hear Mark Turner's talk, which is called Self and Other in Time and Space. So please, Mark. the ground. Um, so for standard uh, citation would be Lanaker, 1985. The ground includes the speech event, its setting, and its participants. Very basic idea, something that's supposed to make it possible for us to have a concept of what language is and not lose our moorings. There's the speaker right there, and there's the hearer right there. And speaking of right there, they're right there now. Time, the speech of it, just like this situation here. There's the location of the site of the speech event, in this case at the uh, meeting room, the presentation room of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. Very basic, something that can help us uh, hold on to what's happening. And sometimes there has been a consideration of a surrogate ground, because it seems as if language can prompt us to do this strange thing, which is to have another conception of another ground in addition to the basic one we have here. So Lanneker, for instance, Ron Lanneker talks about the predicate say, he said, boom. And then you know that in addition to the ground you're in now, you have to imagine another ground in which the speaker is not the present speaker, but someone else who's being quoted. And since it's said in the past tense, uh, it will be at a different time and perhaps in a different location. This is regarded as difficult. Now, there have been many earlier anticipations of notions of speaker, addresser, addressee, context, and so on. Uh, rhetoric, classical rhetoricians, philologists, Susu, Jakobson, uh, and there have been a lot of related analyses in Cogling. So Charles Fillmore's early Santa Cruz lectures in Dykes, Lynn Talmy's 1986 work, where he talks about decoupling, those odd moments when you can sort of move away from the obvious given ground to another ground and have both of them going. Uh, Joe Ruba wrote a paper in 1996, Alternate Grounds. Uh, in the interpretation of Dykes, where again she's talking about someone narrating another ground in which his speech events uh, occurred. Well, I'd like to point out that much of cognitive linguistics has consisted of taking things that were supposed to be very simple and stable starting points and showing that, in fact, they're not simple and that they're, they're not really starting points. That, uh, so an example that you will all know, for instance, will be uh, Fillmore, Kay, and O'Connor's 
paper regularity and idiomaticity the case of let alone. Uh, a, a, a very unaggressive title, technical title, for what is actually a very aggressive point. And that is that if you take all of the grammatical knowledge we have that's supposed to just be frozen, like kick the bucket, all those things that have been pushed into the lexicon as memorized items that you didn't have to analyze or for which you didn't have to have much of a theory, all those strange things that people say that aren't in the core grammar. And in fact, what you find is that this is not just a list. This itself has deep grammatical structure. And the amount of native competence of the grammar of what's in the lexicon or you know, the, uh, the flea service um, is as rich as anything you would need for supposedly core grammar. So if you're going to have to work up all of the grammatical theory for these other things that you wish you didn't have to, have to look at with blinders here, and what you work up there in construction grammar is adequate for dealing with supposedly core grammar, then why have the divide and why give yourself only 1% of the language when you could have 100% of the language if you started somewhere else? So they take for you know, the one half of you, I mean the one half of one person here who hasn't already heard this, they take things like let alone. Um, like, you know, you couldn't get uh, me, let alone her, to do this, right? And they go through in this fabulous dancing fashion. You couldn't get John, let alone Mary, to wash, let alone wax your car, let alone your truck for five dollars, <laughs> let alone two. And the, the, the amount of grammar on what you can do and what you can't do just in let alone, I mean, you'd have to have a special genetic module just for the let alone uh, construction, right? So, uh, so that won't work, theoretically. And I want to do, this is the whole talk, I want to do the same thing right here. I want to say that a tremendous amount is going on always in our understanding of the ground. And that words don't mean, constructions don't mean, they're prompts for us to do extremely complicated work in order to construct a meaning. Uh, and uh, that we're going to see this by looking at, as is my hallmark, some slightly unusual cases. But the argument is essentially going to be that what's going on in the unusual cases is going on all the time. You just don't see past the cartoon, because that's, that's what it means to be a speaker of a language. Right? Everything that's happening right now, we're all linguists, but we're not actually seeing what's going on. And I would like to cite an early paper, which I heard unpublished by Jeff Lansing, 1989, called Impersonal You. Unpublished manuscript, it's been cited by a few people. If anybody, I, I had this once in 1989, and I saw Jeff give it at UCSD. <coughs> I've lost track of it. If anybody knows where it is, please uh, let me know. He pointed out that not only is there personal you or generic you, which is the equivalent of like what, but there's also a kind of, you know, you will be fine if you jaywalk. That's, a, that's one will be fine if one jaywalks, especially in Norway. There's also a kind of impersonal you, and I don't remember any of the, exam the wonderful examples he had, but it would be something like this. Some talk, somebody talking about sailing around in the Caribbean when they were young. In those days, when you got into port, you really wanted to go inland to the parties. Now, it might be that you, the port's not there anymore, that there are no parties there anymore, so you couldn't do it. But it also doesn't just mean one, because you're being invited, as is obvious, sort of to agree with this view. You, you the audience, is being invited to understand that this is a normal um, perspective, that you're supposed to focus on this and agree with it. You're supposed to share it. And if you haven't noticed this before, you'll, pe you'll notice people routinely switching into, well, you had to try the cheese, which would, is an invitation that you will recognize the axiological or cultural position that's being taken. Uh, and as he says, it's not a good one. Now, little commercial, 
I'm tired of losing uh, cognitive linguistics work. Just think of all those wonderful handouts that I had in my hands in my youth. Jim McCauley, Charles Fillmore, Ron Lanneker, Lynn Towey, all these things gone. Poof, you know? Tempest Fugit. Um, but that's the disappearance of these sorts of things is one of the reasons that I uh, joined the team at SSRN.com. It is by scholars, for scholars. Uh, you, it's got 425,000 abstracts and 350,000 downloadable full text articles. Over 50 million downloads, running at 8.5 million per year. I'm the director of the Cognitive Science Network. Uh, it's not for profit, pro bono, never takes copyright. Authors can upload papers, search, download papers. It's all free. Posting a working paper doesn't count as a publication. You can put it up, you can take it down, you can leave the abstract, you can put a link. You want it, you can do anything you want. Um, it, the papers can be posted in any language. This is important for linguists, so long as there's a translation into English of the title and a little abstract. On your own web page, you can put a link to go there. You get your own author page. Uh, here's mine. On that page, there'll be various links to abstracts and how to download it. Uh, each paper gets a kind of presentation. It's got fabulous search utilities. We send out every week a little email letter on cognitive linguistics of what's been posted that week. So here's Alan Chenke on the role of human scale and body metaphors and blends in speech. It has a privileged relationship with Google and with other search uh, engines. And if you want to know anything more about it, just go to markturner.org and click on the kind of science network. Tomorrow's research today, but frankly, I'd like to see some of yesterday's research uh, still be here. You can ask me about that if you're interested. Back, back to Jeff Lansing, whose paper I have uh, lost. So what I'd like to say is, where's the ground in something like this? Jeremy now, Scott Baptist, president of BaptistReports.com and author of The People's Money. Also, Chris Skyrock, our Fox News digital politics editor and host of Power Play on FoxNews.com. All right, guys, thank you both so much for being here. So, Scott, uh, Okay, so um, here and now are being analyzed by the linguistics team at the Center for Advanced Study this year. The members of uh, the, the many authors of a big paper are sitting right here in front of me. It's been a great honor that they would um, include me in their group. Uh, if you look at the here and the now, you see immediately where's the here, right? Uh, these three people are in different places. And so, presumably, is the viewer. What's the viewer? Where's the? Are you the viewer? All of you the viewer now? And she, but she can say things like joining me now. Now, this is a three-way video conference. How are they joining her? Now, I'm, I'm sure answers are coming to mind. And that's good. Those are just the kinds of answers I want to stimulate. So, you know, thanks for being here, joining me now. Notice, by the way, they're all looking at out, out of the screen. Right? And we know this construction. It means they're looking at you. Right? And in many cases, it means they're not only looking at you, you, self and other, but they are looking at each other while they're looking at you, despite the fact that their gaze is perfectly parallel. So if you've got two actual people and their, their gazes are actually parallel, then they are not looking at each other. But do know, without any work, that these people in this situation are often seeing each other and you, and you're seeing them. Um, okay, here's another you. This is from the early show, uh, 8 a.m. or something like that. as we welcome you all back to the early show. Now, how am I being welcomed back? This is, <laughs> this is the beginning of the show. Maybe it means I watched it yesterday, but how do they know I watched this yesterday, right? <laughs> now, when you ask questions like this, the kinds of questions that you could ask in other situations, you realize immediately 
that it makes people laugh. Why does it make people laugh? Because only an uncooperative person would ask those questions. We know that the selected projections prompted for by you, in this case, do not include some of the selected projections that we make in some other uh, circumstances. Um, now, <clears throat> this guy's going to say you've heard the news, and I checked. The news he's going to tell you you have heard was not reported by him earlier in the show. I have heard the news. Now, if I asked you what it could possibly mean, you could probably take two or three paragraphs and tell me. But you got what he meant almost immediately, right? So who is it that has heard the news? Um, this guy is going to say you saw the story unfolding live. So this isn't just a generic throw it away you out there. He's actually telling me about my mind or he's telling somebody about mine, or he's asking you to construct some kind of space in which a person has some knowledge and he knows what that knowledge is, right? Fatal crash involving a fire truck early this morning in the Riverside area. The fire truck was responding to a call at seven this morning when it called. Now, he says he responded to a call at seven. Fatal crash involving a fire truck early this morning in the Riverside area. The fire truck was responding to a call at 7 this morning when it collided with a truck. This was the view from News Chopper 2. So the story unfolded live was breaking news on our CBS News between 5 and 7 a.m. You saw the story unfolding live as breaking news between 5 and 7 a.m. Now I assure you, given my sleep patterns, I did not see the news between 5 and 7 a.m. In fact, I don't know what you did either. So what is this you? It's not a strange you. One of the reasons I'm using this is it's not some line from lyric poetry, uh, from Rilke that prompts you to reconsider the self and the soul and drive you into depression and therapy or something. No, this goes down smooth as, smooth as honey. You're whipping eggs, you're trying to get kids out the door, whatever, and this goes by. It's just nothing remarkable. This is not costly, doesn't take any effort, it's not a, we don't say, wow, this person should get the Nobel Prize for this strange use of you that we, you know, no, there's no Nobel Prize in linguistics. Okay, and here I'm going to show you the, the close. This is how uh, somebody who makes $8 million a year and is the routinely ranked as the second or third most trusted person in America, you won't know who this person is because he's on Fox News and you're bohemian bourgeois academics like me. Uh, he's going to give you his standard sign-off. And now you know the news of this Thursday, March the 20th, 2008. I'm Shepard Smith. Thanks for having us in. And, and now you know the news, okay? Now, this is always broadcast live, uh, except when it's not. So what he knows and you know is that there's, a big de there's always a big delay even when they're broadcasting it live somebody has a heart attack on camera, they want a chance to recover and not actually broadcast that, right? So, uh, and also, many, many people now record these things to watch a little bit later after dinner on TiVo and things like that. They know that. Okay, so you know the news can't be the moment of utterance in those cases. But moreover, notice he says, thanks for having us in. Now, I, I can't be thanked for having him in until after I've had him in, right? So the, and there are different viewers all over the lot. So the moment, uh, what, where's the time, and who's the you, and who's, who's the I? Okay, well what I want to say is, look, we know that the mind produces an interface for dealing with the world. Think of it as a cartoon. I'm not dissing these cartoons. I'm not disrespecting these cartoons. They're all important, and they have to work just right. But they're cartoons. So for instance, take something like color. We have this cartoon that colors in the world. This something reflects light to us, and we see it as a color. There's that light coming at us, must be red. Colors in the world, it feels as if it's in the world. But of course, it's not. Um, this is bad projection, but if you could see it, you'd see that this blue and that blue look the same to you. 
And this is going to be really unfortunate here, but it might work. So focus on the A and the B of these squares, okay? Now, I assure you that all I did was delete the pixels, not on A and B. Look at B. Okay, that's not an illusion. That's a good thing. You create color in the world by taking the, a differential assessment of the illuminant and then applying it to the three, or if you happen to be one of a few females, four different bandwidths of uh, cones in your retina and figuring out what, what color to assign to that light that's coming from that spot based on the context. So that the same, the identical light coming from, um, uh, well, if, you, if, if I show you red and green under standard illumination, and I measure the light coming off the red, like in the Mondrian or something, and then I have my projectors and I adjust the three wave bands. So the identical light is coming off the green one, the one that was green. The identical light is coming off. It will still look just as green as it looked before, right? Because you're constructing color. And importantly, and this is going to be important for later, you're not accessing your stored concept of red. You're generating it on the fly. You're doing this, you know, mill a millisecond order. Isn't that a lot of work? How can you be generating color all the time? That's what the brain is built for. That's what you do. It's very complicated. And the cartoon you've got is you didn't have to do any work at all. The thing told you it was red. So here's another one. Most people see uh, the southwest to northeast line of red is a little darker. But if you just delete the green, right? So you've seen all these things. But there are other sorts of things. I see you as there. You're right there. Vision shows me there. But of course, you know all of it is happening right here. And it's part of the cartoon to project it to that. It's a good thing we can do that. Similarly, sound, all of the sound is happening right here. But when I hear you, I, my brain is set up to project an interface. So think of it a little bit like a, um, an interface for a computer. Pain, too. You know, you think your toe hurts. Of course, it's in your nervous system that the pain is generated. There happens to be a little axon that goes down to your toe. And this is why if you get amputation and it's not done just right, people will continue to feel pain. And they don't feel pain at the amputation spot. They'll feel the pain in the toe, right? And they'll reach down and try to scratch and so on because the brain is set to project this interface. Our body works this way. Now, this is not some postmodern, we're all making it up, you can do whatever you want. This interface is very tightly constrained. Right? If you don't get things right, you're going to die. But it's not that it's loosey-goosey and just anything you want, but it is a cartoon. And it looks like a very stable cartoon for something that's vastly complicated and is a process, not an access. Okay, so if you delete the file on your uh, window in the computer, it's not like there are no consequences. Of course they are. Then you can't get the information back. But you know that's just an interface. Your information isn't a real file sitting on a computer desktop. It's, that's a cartoon for what's really going on down at the level of the hard disk. Well, people have to have these cartoons. And so what I want to say is that uh, ah, that of course self and other, I and you, the addressee, and the here and now are, are part of this interface. A part of a cartoon. Uh, it's not a stable and simple thing at all. We're putting it together all the time. It's a process. Now we do this when we conceive of other minds. Um, so from children's books, this is the brave little toaster. And this is a, a riff on uh, Sir Walter Scott's um, Canto VI of the Lay of the Last Minstrel. Lives there a man with soul so dead, he's never to his toaster said, you are my friend. I see in you an object sturdy, staunch, and true, a fellow medicine trim, a brightness that the years can't dim. 
then let us praise the brave appliance in which we place this just reliance and offer it with each fresh slice such words of friendship and advice as how are things with you tonight or not too dark but not too light. <laughs> okay, so somebody speaking to you lives there, but of course inside there's a you and it's a toaster and this may seem very strange, but it isn't, it isn't at all. Uh, the attribution of animacy to inanimate things is a standard part of human cognition. It's not uh, something that they lock you up for. On the contrary, if you can't do it, you're not normal. And uh, this was tested N400 is an ERP spike that you get for difficulty of processing or surprise. And uh, so they looked at linguistic theories that said, hey, people put together the basic meaning. And in that basic meaning, we know only to attribute animacy to conspecifics or other animate agents. And so you construct that. It's true that you may get one of these weird lyric poets or Walt Disney violating that, but then, but then on this two-step model, you're going to get an N400 spike. So they showed if you just come winging in with one of these, you know, the peanut fell in love, then okay, you can get an N400 spike. But if you just set it up at all, at all, even way back, so that anybody's even paying a kind of attention to the peanut or something like that, then you don't get the spike. In fact, you can have more difficulty for the peanut was salted than for the peanut fell in love, just depending on what the context uh, is. So the attribution of anim animacy is uh, very normal. And I think they did the right thing in saying that what you're doing is blending, and the blending depends upon context. I like this study. One of the reasons I like it is they, one of the tests they use is the girl comforted the clock. And uh, often in the morning, I have uh, addressed my clock, not in, not in tones of comfort, now, the concept of another mind involves blending and creation because, of course, we have no access to anyone else's mind at all through any means. And this has been known for a long time. Adam Smith, in uh, the middle of the 18th century, says that we can have no immediate experience of what other minds are, are going through, our, our, our abilities can't ever give us that. The only way we can do that to carry us beyond our own person is by imagining that we are in that person's place. So we take some knowledge we have of somebody out there and we make a blend of ourselves, and we attribute, we project some of ourselves so now they become minded so if they react, if they move in a certain way, now we think they're reacting. If their eyes are open, we think they're alert. Notice you can't see that somebody's alert. It's a cartoon. You can't see that somebody's interested. You can see the visual field, right? Some photons. You can't see their mind. And he has fabulous long analyses of this. One of them, for example, is we sympathize even with the dead. And he talks about the fact that, you know, you think how terrible it must be for them down there to be corroding in the cold grave and, and on and on. Their memories, forgotten children are forgetting. And he points out, of course, it doesn't matter what you think. If you think they're in heaven, then of course they're not in the grave. And if you think they're dead, then they're not suffering at all. But you can't stand it because you're making a blend of yourself and the dead. It's really wonderful analysis. So the full concept of the other depends upon blending. And there is a notion of theory of mind that you've got this module that lets you pick out another mind. Uh, my proposal would be that this is um, not a modular operation limited to conspecifics. It's supposed to be that autism is when you have trouble with this. In fact, in the pervasive developmental disorder spectrum, we find that people are often extremely good at blending. And it's not so much that they can't attribute mind to somebody else, it's they attribute too much of their own. They call it professor syndrome. Talk right over people. Or on, they operate with cursive knowledge. They don't believe that you don't know what they know. They're irritated at you when you ask for an explanation because of course they have to know. It's sort of a super strong attribution of mind in, in many of these cases in PDD. So someone like Tomasello, 
with whom I've talked about this, Mike Tomasello, I had him for uh, seminars and so on. He's really got a great idea of this mindedness and uh, joint attention with fun specifics. What I would say is I think it's just a category mistake. It's all important and crucial, but it's one application of this kind of blending. And it's not at all limited to con specifics. The you can be the table. Like, think of your car, right? But the concept of self is also very difficult to put together. Now, there are a lot of people who've worked on this, Damasio, Tolving, Nicer, Furnio. What I want to say is that, you know, the person standing before you looks very different than the baby who popped out 58 years ago from my mother, right? But despite the manifest, disanalogies across all those things. We compress them to a unique identity. We use a proper name. Think of that. Language invests a tremendous amount of capital trying to give you all a proper name, a birthday, to insist that there's a, a you there. There's a, there's a stable thing. Uh, all of the analogies get projected to uniqueness. The disanalogies get projected to change. This is a very standard thing to do in thought and language. The cars get three feet bigger when you enter Pacific Heights. Usually doesn't mean that the cars actually grew. It means that there are analogies across the cars and they get compressed to the cars and get bigger. No car got bigger. Those are disanalogies between the cars, but now they're change. For The fences get taller as you move westward. Dinosaurs evolved into birds. This is just what we say. No dinosaur turned into a bird. <laughs> no. Fast analogies and disanalogies, and dinosaurs get compressed to dinosaurs, and then these disanalogies across hundreds of thousands of organisms get projected down to group or changed or turned. You say this when the light turned red. Even though there's a red light, there's a green light, the green light goes off, the red light goes on, and you say the light turned red. Okay, extremely common pattern. You'll find it all over. Your French has disappeared. Where's my French and how could it disappear? <laughs> right? Uh, make this problem go away. Kick the habit. Make this envelope disappear. That's when you signed up for electronic delivery. And a poem, uh, poetry by Marianne Moore, referred to by um, uh, 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 Hugh Kenner, a literary critic. This is work by Vera Tobin, brilliant work, dissertation. He refers to the poem as that one scarred by all those revisions. Now we have all the drafts of the poem, they publish them together, none of them is damaged. There are just differences between texts and the analogies between them get compressed to the poem. What do you mean the poem? And the disanalogies get compressed to change, scarred. The one was scarred, very common. So the self is of course a compression to a unique entity with changes. And this is what we have to do whenever we're dealing with a self, whether it's ourself or somebody else. Now, you can see in publication explicit blends of self and other and how complicated they are. Um, if I were you, I would quit my job, for example. But I'm independently wealthy. You shouldn't quit by any means. But I'm a hothead who would regret it later and would have to go back on my knees begging. And so should you, but you shouldn't. But that's only because the boss needs me so much. Because being you would make me so utterly miserable I couldn't possibly get any work done. Since I would have a wealthy father, since you have another job offer, since I have another job offer, since your beloved boss, or my favorite one, said by an employee to the boss, if I were you, I would quit my job since I couldn't live with myself knowing how badly I had treated me. Okay? <laughs> No problem, everybody has these all over the place. Well, once you've got self and other than then, as Thomasella has rightly stressed and others, you can put together a scene of joint attention in which we've got an I and a you and a here and a now and maybe a thing we're paying attention to. So this looks very much like the ground. And um, I should point out, we're the only ones that seem to have this kind of robust ability. Joint attention in the ground with another you is something extremely difficult and impossible for other species beyond a certain, right? So that should be a, a tip off that the ground is not so simple. We're it. We're the only ones who can manage it. 10,000 milky ways of neurons and connections in your brain needed to pull this off. So maybe it's not a surprise that a lot's going on and that's a process. And so there's joint attention. All those nurses looking down at somebody operating. And it's not surprising that an awful lot of speech and gesture has evolved 
to help us manage joint attention. But it's not a surprise that it's very, very flexible, and that if we wanted to analyze dyxis and the ground cognitively, we would need to go back through all of the different kinds of online processing that produce this kind of, this kind of uh, meaning, this kind of problem. So if you look at something like this, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler, join a partial club today, hanging in the uh, National Museum of American History and the Smithsonian. Okay, you, who's the you? Right, who's the speaker? W when's the win? When's the you ride? Notice this is an imperative join. You join is the implicit. And today, right? Okay, so this can look really, I mean, it's instantly understandable. And who's this guy? Notice this works, even if I don't drive. I don't say, oh, that's not for me, I don't drive. Or I don't say, I don't, I don't drive a car like that. Or I don't say, I don't, I don't wear a hat like that. Right? No, no. There's an, so there's an implied speaker. There's an implied hearer. And we are invited to put together a conception of ourselves and to undergo a kind of interesting blend of ourselves and the implied hearer or the implied viewer in order to get the inferences that happens like this. This is all over the place if you look at Al Gore, the end of an inconvenient truth. Um, future is about global warming. Future generations may well on occasion ask themselves, what were our parents thinking? Why didn't they wake up when they had the chance? We have to hear that from them now. Okay? So who's the them? That's, you know, billions of people who aren't born yet and you'll never see them. Who's the we? That's us. Notice they're proud, they're not our kids. It works if you don't have kids. It works if they're just thinking. It works if they're writing. It works if, you know, if they're dead. It, I mean, it, it works, you have all these wild compressions going on. And there's a little cartoon there in which there's a speaker and a hearer. And we are blending with um, this vast amount of information in order to put it together. Okay, uh, you're used to this from telephone and personal letters and so on, but the one I want to end with is television network news, which you saw. This is very common, these kinds of blends. After you've done all the work to put together a concept of joint attention and the language that can go with it, uh, you can just take employees of the TV network, lots of technology, lots of events, people, places, and times, and blend, and then you get So you won't be surprised now that I can pull up thousands of hits of things like, hi there everybody, welcome, uh, or welcome back, welcome back, a quick update for you, this, this is just the way anchors talk, that's it for us here at 6 o'clock, hope to see you at 11 o'clock tonight, until then, have a great evening, and so on. Now, what I want to say is there are implied hearers in the language, we're being prompted to put together the kind of person who might be hearing this, there can be an implied reader. So the opening of Huck Finn is, by Mark Twain, you don't know about me without you've read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain and told the truth, mainly. Now, of course, it's Mark Twain who's writing this. So we think, well, there's Samuel Clemens, who's already a compression, and he's creating this implied author uh, Mark Twain, but the implied author is creating an implied speaker who's Huck Fenn, and the language is prompting you to put to, to conceive that there's an implied hearer, and that and that you are supposed to do some kind of blend of yourself and the implied hearer, and that this is just normal. This is the opening sentence. Um, all over the lot. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name. Pleased to meet you. How does he know what's puzzling me? I don't ask that, right? There's an implied hearer. We are supposed to try to make a blend of ourselves and that kind of person. If you meet me, have some courtesy, have some sympathy and some taste. Use all your well-learned politesse 
or I'll lay your soul to waste. Okay, in, so what have we got? The ground is a dynamic compression. It involves multiple compressions over multiple networks, and it always does. The self in the moment of communication is already a compression over a vast mental network. The self in a moment of communication is putting forward an implied self, and you know this, when somebody's speaking to you, you know that there is this network of the self behind them, but they are also suggesting that there's an implied self speaking in a certain role, it can shift while they're talking, and you, much of humor or of your, what would just be called social cognition, is your ability to gauge the differences between the actual person and the implied speaker. They're putting on this, they're doing on that, and they never really get out of it, right? And you have to sense whether they're tense about what they're saying, is, is it going down smoothly, are they on autopilot, is there really a self there? This is always going on. Uh, the self in the moment of communication has to construct a hero and an implied hero. Right? And they can be very, very, very different. Uh, in the cases where you can get feedback, and I think this is sort of what we do all the time, where we get feedback, we've constructed a hearer, and then we see it's not quite lining up. Right? We, we mispredicted that person that isn't responding in the way we thought, or they don't look the way they thought we thought they would when we say something. Right? So we get a little bit of feedback. The speaker and the implied speaker can both put forward implied hearers, that is, uh, both um, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, and Huck Finn can all be putting forward different implied hearers. There can be first order implied hearers and second order implied hearers, and we can be invited to choose where we want to sit between them. If that's a little confusing, what I mean is this kind of thing where somebody says something and they're implying that they're speaking to somebody with whom you would disagree or that you would hate, right? but that that hearer is agreeing with them. So they're saying something despicable to somebody who agrees with them. And what we are doing is looking down on this interaction, right? So there's the first order implied here, which is the bad person I don't agree with. And then there's the second order implied here, which is you. And the two of you are supposed, of course, naturally you're in disagreement. You're not, agree you're not agreeing with the person I'm actually applying, or talking to. So, you, and we can invite various negotiations. So this is just standard uh, Jonathan Smith, uh, Swift, rather, a modest proposal. It is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, six children, all in rags, and importuning every passenger for an alms. Now, he's taking on the pose of someone who's very reasonable, talking to somebody very reasonable. This is where Americans start to get it. I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well-nursed, is at a year old, a most delicious and nourishing, wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragu. Right? Okay. Now, here you start to realize that this is a satire of the treatment of children in Ireland. But he's speaking as if there's an implied speaker here, which is a very reasonable person, speaking to people who would think he's reasonable. But of course, Jonathan Swift and we on the outside are looking at this because there are other implied uh, people and other implied hearers, you're after all reading this, who make different compressions and have to decide how to blend themselves in where. Same thing, Lettre Provenciale, uh, Blaise Pascal. Sir, how wrong we were. We, who's this we? Of course, it's just a general, I ha only had my eyes opened yesterday, right? So the creation of sort of the ground, it's not that it's not there, but it's like color, right? You have to put it together, it's very complicated. And we get, it's not just in advanced literature, we get just the same thing in the United States, and here the Americans are really going to get it. Uh, you're going to hate me for doing this, but it's true. Um, we have these kind of ideological pseudo-anchors in the United States who pretend to be doing the news, um, but they're not. And uh, so we had a strike, a public sector strike here in Norway. 
So they also had uh, interesting issues with public sector workers in the United States. In uh, Wisconsin, they were recalling the governor. They had a recall election for a governor who had been trying to limit the benefits of public sector workers. He, it's only the third time in the United States history that a governor has had to submit to a recall, not a re-election, a recall election, and he was not recalled. He, he won, right? Tonight, liberal orthodoxy takes a big hit in Wisconsin. That is the subject of this evening's talking points memo. Governor Scott Walker keeping his job, defeating the progressive forces by a wide margin yesterday, and issued future compensation for state union workers. The government wants to cut that back. The left does not. But since cities and counties are going bankrupt all over the USA because they can't pay the big pensions, and because public workers often make far more money than private workers who do the same job, Americans are finally beginning to rise up. So who's the implied hero? No it isn't you. Governments throughout the USA can't afford any more expenditures. Period. Governor Walker knows that. And he's done a pretty good job turning the Wisconsin economy around. The deficit there is down big time and unemployment is dropping as well. So why on earth would you want to throw the man out? Ideology. That's why. This hurts us all. Every single one of you out there in the nation, if you're watching, democracy dying tonight. Very emotional. I'm very emotional because we all have a lot invested in this. This was it. If we didn't win tonight, the end of the USA as we know it just happened. Sure. Now that man, I doubt. He has no idea what democracy is. The folks vote. They sign laws. That's democracy, you pinhead. That's democracy, you pinhead. Okay. Now, of course, who are you? Where are you? They bring in. No, no. I'm, I'm going to get the Hana button here that says, "I don't care what it says. We're just don't get into the ideology. Don't think about what you agree with. I don't care. We're just looking at linguistics." Okay. I'm going to give you the other side in a second. Um, and we're not here to have sides. We're here to look at the construction of the ground and linguistic prompts for those kinds of compressions. Of course, the implied hero agrees with it, right? Now, John Stewart, um, notice he quoted CNN, by the way, he put it inside so you have these nested grounds and so on. John Stewart's now going to do the opposite thing by making fun of Fox News. They're looking at each other, by the way, right? No. I think we all agree that it's a fairly reasonable way of framing this discussion for the Pro Walker Wisconsin school teacher. But if Governor Walker's not reelected and the unions continue to thrive, I see a lot of freedoms and choices for teachers from Wisconsin, um, for people who live in the state, to be taken away. I, it's not going to get as extreme as, as, extreme as communism, but. Those choices will slowly go away. It'll be like communist China. If Walker loses, I mean, we'll all be forced to join unions, like in China. <laughs> so, Bertrand Carlson, bravely standing up to Wisconsin's moderate jack booted union thugs. So, you can see many, many different views and many different possibilities for projection into those different views, the I and the U. His voice is located at many different spots over the network, as is your attention and your hearing. Uh, so what I want to say is the ground really is a kind of cartoon, very useful one, inside a vast number of conceptual uh, compression. And this will be the last example. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows the network. That's why this is funny. this a little differently, so I'm going to turn off the mirror, turn on the mirroring so that I can uh, just jump to the right spots. So now presenting tonight's top ten list through the magic of television. Uh, this is the map room from the map room of the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to First Lady Michelle Obama. Hello there. This is Obama. Hey. 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 Okay, everybody say hello. He says hello, Mrs. Obama.